Good afternoon and welcome to the Middle East Forums webinar and podcast C series featuring talks from Middle East Forums projects. My name is Dexter Van Zyl and I am the managing editor of Focus on Western Islamism. And today's guest is Joe Kaufman, a journalist from South Floor, who's written a number of exposés about Islamists in Broward County and other places in South Florida. In addition to describing the problems there, he will describe his efforts to expose and combat Islamist influence on local government. And before we begin, I would like to remind everyone and encourage about the Q&A at the bottom of their screen uh, and ask them if they have any questions during the Q and uh, during the, the, the seminar, uh, ask them to just, uh, you know, hit that button and start typing away and we'll get to the uh, uh, questions later on. And Joe, it's really good to have you here today. And I guess my uh, kind of an obvious question is how did you become one of the people who covers Islamism in South Florida and who are the main actors that you pay attention to? Thank you, Dexter, for having me. Thank you, Middle East Forum. Um, well, years ago, I was the editor, the English editor of a, a bilingual Hebrew English uh, newspaper called the Jewish Israeli Magazine, and then it became uh, the Isra Post. And, and, uh, and I worked with, I, I had written a, a political column for it for years, and, and it was all run by Israelis, and their English wasn't so great, so they actually made me the, the English editor. And while there, we started receiving crazy uh, emails, what I thought was, excuse my language, BS, uh, about an impending attack against the United States. This was roughly five months before 9-11. And after a series of these emails, I, I began to take it seriously and I started doing research. Um, not that I was a great researcher at the time, but I, I, I learned on the job and, and, uh, and I had access to a lot of important individuals in Israel and all of that and people who, who uh, who would translate Arabic. And, and to make a long story short, um, exactly one month prior to 9-11, I wrote an article where I, I, uh, I basically predicted 9-11. I said the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center was non-aberration and that it was, God forbid, going to happen again. Um, I was part of a, a group of individuals in, in South Florida that were constantly talking about what was going on in Israel with the terrorism situation. And for, for months, I was saying that the, that the situation was not just targeted towards Israel, but it was targeted towards the United States. And one of the individuals that I had worked with over there, who was part of this, this, uh, this group of individuals was Baylor Rabinowitz, who now is the director of the Middle East, of the, uh, sorry, the militant Islam um, monitor. And, and, uh, and to this day, we're, we're working together. And she said she wanted to help me with this. And, and we got together and not knowing about anything really to do with Al-Qaeda or, or, or Islamism or, or any of that stuff. But we learned quickly. And, uh, and a, lot of our, a, lot of our a lot of the material that we uh, downloaded off of the, off of the web um, before these websites became clear was, was actionable. And I started meeting with the with the feds and getting a getting a relationship with with different agencies. And to make a long story short, um, uh, roughly a half dozen organizations that that we were doing research on in the next um, in the next roughly six years would be would be shut down as a result of the uh, of the work that that Ms. Rabinowitz and I had uh, had done. And that's how I got involved in this. So right now, essentially, you're dealing with like legal Islamist or nonviolent Islamism, uh, people who are essentially working to essentially undermine the political order in the United States without firing a shot. And, and, and you know, who are the people that you, that you worry about? Well, certainly it's the, it's the uh, alphabet groups, you know, the, the CARE and, and ISNA and ICNA and 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 local groups like uh, uh, Mana, there's a there's a group, uh, the American Muslim Association of North America, ha headed by an individual that that uh, that believes he's a, he's part of Hamas and, and who is you know posts a lot about Hamas and and uh, even 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 uh, Holocaust uh, praising Holocaust denial websites. Um, uh, this individual's name is Sophie Zakow, and he. 
he's involved in, in, in a lot of the South Florida Muslim organizations. And, and, uh, and thankfully, the, the anti-crime groups, um, major groups like Crime Stoppers and, and, uh, and, and, and Citizens Crime Watch, they listened to me and they saw my material and they, and they got rid of him out of his had because he was sitting on the board of directors of these organizations. And that's really, that's really the crux of, of this whole situation. Um, Islamists who, uh, who, are, who are connected um, maybe to terrorism, maybe to groups connected to terrorism, um, but, cer but certainly um, have links to these terror-related organizations and individuals. Um, they have somewhat, somehow embedded themselves um, or try to at least in in our local governments, in our national governments, and that's really my focus is to expose and and uh, and out those organizations and hope and hope to stop them. Now, what's the response that you've gotten from local officials, like mayors and city councilors and, and members of the school board? Did they take this threat seriously, or did they ignore it? I, I would say that that most of the time they ignore it. You know, I, I, I had run for office in the, in the past and I, I understand this, this game um, of politicians where they, they, they want votes, they want that power, they want that, they want that money that comes along with, you know, with service, with public service. And, and a lot of times they, uh, they find themselves supporting these organizations. I believe, at least, it's my opinion that they that they try to support them for because they feel like it's a voting base um, for them. But whether it is or it isn't, that's you know, it, it's it's still wrong. Um, but I but I believe that they that because of this, because they've allowed themselves to get involved with these these groups, uh, when you out these organizations. It's very easy for them to ignore it because there's not really a backlash for for ignoring it. But sometimes, as we're going to as we're going to discuss, sometimes they listen. All right. Now, talk to me about what happened just recently with the mayor, uh, the Broward County mayor. So, Mayor Fisher, Mayor Lamar Fisher, he, as you said, he's the Broward County mayor, um, one of the largest counties um, in, in Florida, maybe one of the largest counties in, 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 the, in the country, um, Mayor Fisher allowed himself to speak in front of this radical Muslim organization with a lot of dirt and a lot of links to, to terror-related individuals and, and, and organizations. And I, and I called him out on it in an, in an article that I wrote for Front Page where I said that the, here the mayor is speaking in front of a an organization, um, a mosque that's owned by the North American Islamic Trust, um, an entity that even our U.S. government has has said in 2007 and 2008 during the Holy Land Foundation trials was was a co-conspirator, was a party to the raising of millions of dollars for Hamas. So right there, when a when a center is owned by such an entity as this. Uh, right away, it's 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 wrong for the mayor to speak in front of it. But there's a lot more um, details. Uh, very recently, less than it less than a year ago, um, the organization I want to get this this uh, this name right. This organization held a service in honor of somebody named Case Imad Shajaya. I believe this this was October of 2022. So, you know, just months just months ago, held held a, a service in honor of this individual. Who had just who had just been killed by the IDF um, when, as a member of Hamas's militant wing, went into an Israeli town, um, Base L, and started shooting up the town, trying to trying to kill um, citizens, civilians, and he was killed. And all of a sudden, a mosque is doing a a service for this for this individual. And I don't know if there's family members at that mosque or uh, or not. But regardless of that, to do a service um, in honor of an individual, praising that individual, saying this guy should go to the ultimate paradise, um, and that individual's involved in, a, in an international terrorist organization like Hamas, I mean, for the mayor, again, to speak in front of that group, and there's, of course, there's a lot more. We can go through 
um, all of it. But but for him to speak in front of that is 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 wrong in so many ways and dangerous as well because what he's doing is he's legitimizing terror. He's legitimizing radical Islam. He's a re- he's legitimizing this Islamism that we fight against and we should. Right now, one of the things that. You know, when I write, oftentimes I try to keep an idea in my head of who my constituency is or who my 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 reader is. Do you have an idea when you write these articles? Who are you trying to connect with? Who are you trying to grab? Excuse me, I just bumped my computer desk. Who are you trying to grab by the lapels and say, "Look, you got to wake up." Every time I write one of these or write one of these articles, whether I write it today um, as the the published piece in, in your publication came out today or 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 15 years ago you know it 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 to me for me it's it's they're all actionable and that's why I write these things for action to take place whether it's for a public official to to separate themselves or denounce or even work to god forbid work to shut down one of these you know <laughs> Thank God they should, but you know, shut down one of these organizations, um, or or for for law enforcement to get involved and 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 have information to to work off of um, in hopefully a future a future case to uh, to shut down these groups and, and individuals or to get them thrown off of any type of government committees or local committees or anti crime committees you know that that they try to get themselves involved. Um, with because they want to hide from from getting in trouble in the in the future. So really, my idea in writing these is for something actionable, whether it's actionable today or actionable ten years from now. Um, I try to write these things in order for something to take place as a result. Right, and you're looking for programmatic victories. You're looking for real world impact. Absolutely. Okay. Now, what can people do to actually help? accomplish those real world impacts? What can the average citizen or resident of South Florida do t- to marginalize folks, say like at the ICT, uh, you know, the Islamic uh, Center in Tampa that you've written about previously, what can they do? Well, it's, it's, it's just like the, the other issue that we recently dealt with, with Namakon Ghani. Here you have a- an individual involved is, in Islamist organizations, um, posting, posting online on her social media, Talking about um, how how uh, you know posting things, calling for Israel's destruction and such, um, but at the same time uh, serving on committees for the for the county school board. Well, in this case, uh, I was I was ha- very happy to know that people contacted the school board. Um, one individual in particular, uh, she had. I'm not going to give out her name, but she had she had written a letter talking about how she was a parent um, to to children who were in the the Broward County school system, and and I think that letter um, had an impact. It certainly had an impact because in the end, in the end, with with the information that I researched and put out, and and her letter and and phone calls that they received, um, this individual, Nama Kangani, an Islamist serving in these school board committees was thrown off of these committees um, as a result of this. So people should understand that one letter, one phone call can do so much. You know, one individual can move mountains. Um, I know with the, with the work that, that Baylor Rabinowitz and I have done, we've caused the shutdown of, of, of organizations. So just, just, just for simple phone calls and, and, and letters, things like things like the shutdown of these organizations can take place. Right now, so it doesn't take a huge number of phone calls. I mean, it's not like in the movies where you, you know, you, all of a sudden you've got thousands of phone calls and thousands of letters. You know, it's not like Mr. Smith goes to Washington. A couple of phone calls will have a huge impact on uh, on a, a policymaker because they they know that one call has represents a, a number of constituents who feel the same way. And, and, and also, and, 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 may, and maybe, maybe one call people may feel, and maybe rightfully so, um, can't move a politician who's embedded himself or herself with, within this radical Muslim community, within these 
organization shows up for photo ops with these organizations thinking they're going to wind up benefiting politically or, or just for the fact that they want to, um, maybe in the end, those individuals won't do it for political purposes. Maybe they'll just do the right thing. And in that case, the right thing was removing this individual from those committees. And, and I'm thankful to say, and I appreciate Dr. Jeff Holness, the, the school board member um, who had reappointed um, Khan Ghani to these committees, that right away he took action, regardless of whether it would hurt him politically or or not, or hurt him with votes or with donations or any of that stuff, he did the right thing. And sometimes, sometimes politicians do the right thing. I know it's, 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 it's hard to believe out there for people listening, because a lot of the times we, we speak against our politicians and, and, and rightfully so, but sometimes they do the right thing. Right. Now, one of the questions that has been posted by an anonymous attendee says, uh, important work you're doing in Florida, but for all the stupidity of local officials, what about the federal government, even politicians on the right? And as we documented at Middle East Forum, the Trump administration gave tens of millions of dollars to Islamists, including uh, IFNA, Islamic Relief, and others, uh, much more than under Obama. And conservative media wouldn't cover this phenomenon. And today we're seeing increasing efforts by GOP officials to work with Islamists. Why do you think this happen is happening? And what do you think? It's, why does it happen? I, I'm not exactly sure. I know when the, when the Trump administration began, it, it had people like Walid Farris and, and John Bolton and, and others involved. And, and at some, and at some point um, they were distanced. I, I know, um, Dr. Pipes, Daniel Pipes, uh, was appointed during the Bush administration at the very beginning of the administration, where, where people who fought against this type of danger for society were, were part of the administration. And then, and then when President Bush was, was, uh, was voted in for another four years, all of a sudden these individuals were, at, were, were, um, were, were out of the administration. So I'm not exactly sure, but I do know that there's even Muslim countries out there that ban the Muslim Brotherhood, that have that have outlawed the Muslim Brotherhood, like the like the UAE. The UAE calls CARE a, a terrorist organization. You would think that the United States would do so as well, um, but that's not the case. The United States, on some level, still embraces the Muslim Brotherhood. tries to tries to work with. With, uh, with links to them. And, and for that reason, these organizations here in the United States, they're, they're somehow legal. Uh, and CARE, care uh, you know, um, however, CARE, while, while linked to the Muslim Brotherhood, um, also is very linked to Hamas. And, and Hamas is, is outlawed by the United States. You can't finance Hamas. It's, it's, it's illegal. Um, but here you have an organization that was that 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 it's 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 foundation it's it has financial ties um it's been named by the u.s government as a party to financing hamas it's had individuals within it that have been convicted of and or deported from the united states as a result of 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 their connections to hamas and other terrorist groups um you would think that this organization at the very least would have been um, would have been shut down. But unfortunately, uh, the federal government has allowed these groups to remain legal. And, and yes, the Trump administration and, and, and all these other administrations, they, year after year, they finance these groups. And I believe ICNA gets more money every, every, every single year in the tune of millions of, of dollars to, to do what they do. And, and, uh, and, that's, and that's wrong, and, and the U.S. government should take action against the organization, not finance it with our tax dollars. Now, we have a question about uh, Deborah Lidstadt, and I think she is the envoy on anti-Semitism. She's kind of a, the person who's been appointed to fight anti-Semitism. And just recently, uh, she basically kind of said that she was going to kind of wait and see in reference to care when it came time to dealing with fighting against anti-Semitism along with the Biden administration. 
Do you think that the Biden administration's decision to bring care in from the cold, even on some sort of temporary or contingent basis, and I, 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 I'm guessing, do you think that makes your work more difficult? Sure it does. When the federal government is, is aligning themselves with these organizations, of course it makes our, our, our work more, more difficult. Um, the Obama administration was, was doing events and, and writing materials along with the Islamic Society of North America, ISNA. So this is, this is really nothing new and, and no surprise. Um, but the United States government, um, they, they, they do, or at least they, they say that they support um, Israel overseas uh, for whatever reason, but they, but you would think if they support Israel and they, and they have in their own, in their own terrorism list from the state department, um, ha Hamas um, listed there and other, other countries do as well. Um, you would think that they would take it serious enough that they would, um, that they would distance themselves from those organizations. And again, um, because of their connection to terrorism, um, they should be shut down entirely, um, but but unfortunately, like you say, they they uh, they they work with these organizations for political correctness or 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 whatever reason, or for or again for votes, or they think like somehow the 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 Democratic Party is moving so far to the left that they need to embrace these these groups, um, but but they do and it's wrong and they shouldn't do it and yes, it makes our work more difficult. Now, how do the intellectuals or the, the if you probably the expression, the hoi polloi or the chattering classes in South Florida respond to you personally when they find out that you're the guy who basically uncovers and counters all of this Islamist stuff? How do they respond to you? Do they keep you at an arm's length? Do they talk to you privately? Or do they just dismiss you completely? What do they do? For, for the most part, you know, it's it's you know, it's, it's more like arm's length, you know. Um, once in a while, we do discuss things in, in private, but, um, but like you say, in private, um, these groups, especially, especially these, you know, uh, liberal uh, leading Jewish organizations who you would think had a vested interest in, in, in going after these um, groups, they, you know, a lot of times they don't want to um, deal with you. I mean, I know for myself, um, I was, I was involved with the Anti-Defamation League years ago. I was a committeeman for four years. Um, but once I started, you know, revealing this stuff, things, our relationship changed. And, and even though the ADL does, you know, put on their website, um, things about care, a lot, a lot of things about care, which I reference many times in, in my articles. Oh, yeah. And I appreciate, and I appreciate that. Um, um, but still, it's it's very hard to to get these organizations to move, um, even when there's massive anti-Semitism involved. Now, you know, one of the things questions that I always had: Do you think that your your work has a constituency within the Muslim community itself? Do you think that any of them read this and say, and have they ever reached out to you and, and say? We don't like this guy, but the problem is, is that we don't have the capacity to essentially oust these folks from the leadership positions. What do they say to you if they, if they even speak to you? In the, in the time that I've done this, which is now decades, you know, I've, I've gotten white hair over, over all of this. You know, they, I've had, ha I had a number of um, letters sent to me, uh, emailed to me from individuals who have, who have thanked me. Um, yes this this overarching theme of if I come out, I'll be ostracized from from uh, from the community is is there. But yes, there are a number of Muslims who who um, who appreciate it. I, I wouldn't say that's a, a, a very big percentage of people, but it's it's there. And I've I, I've personally worked with Muslims, um, definitely with the issue of I'll give an example. Um, uh, the Islamic Circle of North America, they, they have harbored for over three decades a former death squad leader who's been convicted in absentia, sentenced to death in absentia in Bangladesh for, um, for his role in, in the murders of, 
of at least 18 individuals in the 1971 Bangladesh genocide. This individual is harbored by uh, ICNA and, and, uh, and lives in, in, uh, in Queens, New York, has, has been the president of the New York chapter of ICNA, has, has been the vice president of, of, uh, of ICNA National. Um, and, and there have been a number of, of Muslims who have reached out to me in the Bangladesh community to try to do something about this. And for whatever reason, I understand the US has no extradition treaty to, to Bangladesh, but for whatever reason, the United States wants to hold this individual inside the US, just like the US held the blind Sheikh Omar Abdel uh, Rahman, who was involved in the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center when, when he fled fled Egypt, you know, uh, involved with, with what would become um, Al Qaeda. For some reason, the U.S. government has this this their own suicide pact where they want these in, these these dangerous individuals, dangerous to our country, dangerous to our security, dangerous to the local communities and national um, national society. Um, they want these individuals for whatever reason to stay and remain inside the United States. And uh, sorry to get off on a tangent, but it's 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 such an important issue um, to right. for the U.S. government to to uh, to address, and, and they just don't do it. Okay. Now, one of the we've seen a, a number of questions about what people can do to help, or what we can do to learn more about it. And one of the things that I would encourage people to do is to take their cell phones and text uh, MEF to five two eight eight six to participate in our activism campaign. And uh, one of the last questions that I want to ask you is: Is that obviously you are a defender of? And I don't want to sound too grandiose, but you're a defender of essentially Western civilization, democratic principles. What is it that you are really most interested in protecting about the community that you live in? What is it that really, what is, what's not, what is the threat, but what is it that you actually care the most about when it comes time to protect, to do the work you do? What do you want to protect? Look, I and Israel is is of grave importance. I know it is from for many others, and 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 so for me, primarily, it's a matter of security. I want to I want to protect the homeland and and my Jewish homeland. Um, so that's that's why I do um, what I do, and that's why I'm passionate about it. Okay, I just think we've come to the close of our webinar. I want to thank you, Joe, for the work that you've done. Keep sending us your stuff. And I'm going to ask our audience to be on the lookout for the webinar offerings that will be emailed to you for next week and the days ahead. Days ahead. Thank you so much. And have a great afternoon and a great weekend. Thanks so much. Thank you. Be well. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Joe.